Okay. Uh, let's kick it off and uh, welcome to the Flight Community Sync. November 1st, it's already November. It's crazy. My name is Martin Stein. I'm with Union AI and I'm your host today. And as always, a few housekeeping notes. We record the session and we're going to share it uh, online later. Also, Flight uh, is a fast and quickly growing community. If you want to join, there are more links later at the end of this presentation and conversation, but you can also go to flight.org and uh, see the Slack channel and join us there. Cool, let's take a look at the agenda. Today is actually a pretty uh, short agenda, but we have focus on the community. So we're gonna talk about uh, flight being at KubeCon. That's I think a very interesting take there. Uh, Dan is going to share some impressions there, at least one or two, I think, then. Uh, then we talk uh, with our contributors of the month. I think that's going to be very interesting. It's going to be the main part of the conversation today is really uh, hearing from the community. Um, we also talk with, uh, I think, Ryan, who is uh, uh, participating in the Hacktoberfest as a contributor. And last but not least, we have our Neil Spantilan show the flight sandbox a hosted sandbox not just the sandbox that you install in your machine but a host sandbox and what's up with that so that's the problem i do believe that we're going to be done within probably like 20 minutes maybe less maybe more depends on you know how deep we go um but um we can actually uh so i see case and texting me here something uh and uh maybe I'll have to go over his yes yeah, so so then feel free, you saw um, the message there as well. If you want to go over that, um, we can do this too. So, all right, cool. Let's kick it off. Let's uh, get started with the community updates. Next slide, please. Um, so then uh, we went, uh, not we, but you and uh, a few other team members went to KubeCon uh, last week in Detroit. Uh, it's uh, KubeCon Cloud Native North America. I think officially it was about six to 7,000 people uh, who were there in person and probably the same amount of people who were there virtually. Uh, we had a booth there, Flight, you can see the photo here, the image, uh, and uh, I feel like that was the first time Flight to, to be represented at such a show. Uh, it's a little bit of a stretch because it's a complete infra show and uh, not very strong on, on the data ML side or actually on the ML side. But I, you know, we felt like it was, you know, probably good, good learning experience to go there anyway. So, um, Dan, uh, please uh, introduce yourself real quick and uh, tell us about uh, your impressions of KubeCon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm my name is Dan. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a backend engineer with the Union team. Um, I was one of four team members that went to KubeCon this last week um, from the Union side. Um, just start out by saying it was was an absolutely great time. Uh, we saw a lot of existing users um, of Flight, and it's nice how we put a face to a name. You know, we, we work on Slack all the time, and um, some have pictures, some have don't. Um, but but it's always great to, to kind of see people in person, get to talk through things. Um, and we got to talk to a lot of other people, too, and kind of discuss how Flight may fit into their workflow, and that was just a great experience. Um, a small recap, two kind of just uh, overarching things that we noted throughout the, the, the conference. Um, first off, uh, we saw a central theme that, that there is a need for flight. Um, we had a chance to attend a, a number of different talks, um, spoke with uh, lots of different attendees, um, and kind of saw this increasing importance of cloud native data orchestration, um, specifically like AI and ML workloads um, at massive scale. Um, and I think at the union side and working on flight day to day, we, we kind of lose sight of a lot of different things. One, we've been working uh, on this problem for, for a very long time. Um, but you go to a conference like this and you see that um, there are a lot of organizations, a lot of companies where, where this really is in its infancy um, and they're kind of just testing tools and, and there's a lot of uncertainty there in tooling and best practices, um, et cetera. Um, but we feel that there's a, a lot to gain here. There's a, a, you know, a lot of crossroads that, that flight can make. It's, it's deployable in a lot of different scale um, and has utility in a lot of different environments. Um, secondly, it, it was great to hear uh, people kind of express their opinions that flight does a lot of things right. Um, flight tends to be uh, opinionated about certain things, um, for example, versioning workflows and tasks to, to track data lineages and, and ensuring reproducibility of uh, executions, um, having strongly typed input and output variables. Um, and, and when talking to people, they seem to like these features. They've tried other tooling. There are uh, significant pain points that they ran into. Um, and so kind of this feedback uh, beyond flattering our egos, of course, 
um, it's great to hear, you know, validation and reassurance that that flight is doing um, a lot of different things correctly um, and, and seems to help a lot of people. Um, so just to summarize, KubeCon, um, great experience. Um, we're thankful for all the great people we got to talk to um, and look forward to do kind of more of this stuff in the future. Um, I can pivot over and talk very briefly about the performance RFC um, if we'd like to. Uh, yeah, sounds great. Um, so uh, my work for hopefully the rest of this year is, is kind of focusing on uh, improving the performance of flight propeller and making that more observable. Um, as this is deployed at, at larger and larger scales, people are increasingly concerned about, hey, you know, what is what is flight doing? Where is this overhead? Um, how can we reduce that? Um, and, and right now, I mean, flight does a fantastic job at, at amortizing um, a lot of uh, overhead of, of, you know, parallel execution of tasks on, on cloud native um, things. But we really want to be a little bit more transparent into this, make the performance more observable. Um, and so I, I wrote up an RFC that that. Um, as I was told this morning, reads a little bit like a PhD thesis. So, you know, not, not for the faint of heart, but uh, we'll, we'll open that to the community here, hope, hopefully later today. And um, a couple ideas about just how, you know, we can make performance um, available to end users, um, kind of trying to, to um, provide actionable information so that, you know, you can look into your workflow, say, here's this, I have a concern with how this is running. Um, I know exactly what's happening. Um, and, and, and should be should be pretty nice. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. So so Dan, where, where can we? I mean, obviously there, there's uh, we can share this and people can read through this. I assume. Yeah, so I was just going to post it on the feature discussions channel. Um, I think that's where we typically do these things um, on our Slack. Um, if there's somewhere else we want to post this as well, I'm more than happy to kind of make this available wherever. Okay, cool. And what's the time frame for that? Uh, um, so I've already gotten started on a little bit of the work. Um, so yeah, hopefully in the next few weeks we'll we'll start seeing PRs um, and and yeah, hopefully get this. I'm going to say wrapped up. It's certainly going to be a very iterative process about doing this correctly. Um, but but yeah, uh, month month and a half or so, two months. Fantastic. That's cool. Very good. Okay, so if there's any feedback, I would say community-wise, uh, you know who to speak to. Uh, it's Dan, and uh, you can actually, you know, easily uh, take a look at the flight repo uh, and uh, go to the RFC section and uh, find out what's going on. Fantastic, Dan. Thanks a lot for the for the update. I think uh, the coupon report is very very interesting. Also, look forward to the performance RFC. Um, let's uh, move on and uh, say hello to our contributors. So today we're going to actually spend a little bit more time with contributors. We're going to do a little bit less presentations, talk a little bit more about uh, who's contributing. Uh, we have Eileen, uh, Nicholas, and Justin, and then uh, Ryan here. I, some of uh, the folks are uh, live right now, so we're going to speak a little bit. And uh, who's, our, who's not live, uh, we're going to follow up later. Eileen, thanks a lot uh, for joining us. I think last time I already mentioned you. This time we have you, so I'm super happy. So please, um, if you could unmute yourself and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what you're doing in Pajama. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's super, like, thanks for having me. I know I responded a little bit late to the invite, but I definitely appreciate it. <laughs> I really it. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, my name is Eileen. I'm a software engineer at Pachama. Um, and so at Pachama, we, um, you know, we work on developing a lot of complex analysis um, using like remote sensing data to understand what's going on in like forests around the earth, um, like the amount of biomass um, that's there in the forest, um, the amount of like impact and progress there are in different types of forest projects with the overall goal of providing more transparency and accountability in the carbon market. Um, so as you can imagine, flight is really, really useful to us um, because it allows us to kind of coordinate all these different interdependent processes from just like ingesting all of the remote sensing data that we need to feed our machine learning and other downstream processes um, to providing a platform where we can do like more complex baseline analysis or, um, you know, uncertainty calculations. Um, and yeah, any of those other like downstream post-processing steps, um, Flight ended up being like a really perfect platform um, to host all of those different sorts of pieces, um, especially because, um, you know, one tends to kind of like feed the other and there can be like different possible paths that you take depending on like the type of project or the type of analysis. Um, so yeah, and then also, as you can imagine, um, a lot of those analysis require a lot of like 
really kind of heavy compute. Um, so we're kind of interested in getting, you know, a little bit more insight into what's going on in the flight pods that are running those executions, kind of beyond like what we're already getting with Prometheus. Um, on that note, the RFC that Dan was just talking about sounds like really especially interesting. Um, but yeah, so as we're looking at this, like we already use Datadog at Pachama for like some of our other systems. So we're looking at um, seeing if we could set up Datadog so that it could, um, you know, start giving us some of those more like in-depth metrics and APM tracing and some of the other nice things that Datadog is already giving us. Um, so the like just most basic thing that we needed in order to do that, in order to give Datadog that level of insight into the pods that were actually doing the executions, uh, we pretty much just needed to add a like named mounted volume to the pods. And we tried doing that through um, like adding it to the pod template. Um, and then we found out when we tried applying that, that that didn't really seem to be supported and it looked like it was getting overwritten somewhere. So that's when we decided to kind of like dive in and figure out how the pods were being constructed. Um, and then um, we definitely like I, I spent a whole bunch of time talking with um, with Dan about this and kind of figured out a more generalized approach so that not only like our mounted volumes supported um, uh, through the the pod template, but it's kind of now something that you can use more generally to do a little bit more customization into the pod. Um, if if I, uh, <laughs> this was my first contribution. So if I remember everything um, of the changes that we made, we kind of like, um, in, in terms of the pod construction, I, I think I remember that um, there, some of the stuff in the default container were kind of being overwritten by what was in the primary container. And then some of those configurations were applied kind of later at the end of the pod construction process. So we kind of moved all of that upstream so that the default container could merge into the primary container. Um, a little bit earlier in the pod construction process. So um, any like more general configurations could kind of just all be accounted for at that point. Um, so yeah, that that was the change. Um, and yeah, uh, otherwise I just wanted to say that like, I really only started learning like how to use flight like a few months ago earlier this year. Um, and this was my first contribution. So definitely like as a thanks to Dan for like taking the time to pair with me and like kind of like help me understand um, how all of this stuff worked and um yeah you guys are all like a really awesome community to work with so yeah thanks so much it's awesome having this change fantastic and i just want to give the the word to dan because he worked with you so closely and he uh, introduced you last time so dan a uh, quick question i assume that um the contribution is valuable for other users as well right i mean that has a, a broad application yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, default pod templates, as far as configuration goes, you know, we were having configuration uh, set on the Kate's plugin individually. And so default pod templates, you can create a pod template in a namespace, and then every single pod that flight starts uses that pod template um, as the base configuration for it. So it supports every single option, um, is maintainable between Kubernetes versions. Um, but additionally, uh, Eileen's contribution said, let's configure not just the pod, but individual containers in there as well. Um, and so you can take any any configuration option for a container and say apply this to every container within that pod um, or just the primary container. So so yeah, we've already seen a, a number of different community members use it in different ways. Um, so a very exciting contribution. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Alina, that's fantastic. And also, I mean, that that you know begs also a follow-up question because it just got into flight. So um tell us a little bit maybe what's the highlight uh, what what helped you to get in besides Dan obviously <laughs> that's a big help but you know what went well well for you and and where can we improve just to be a little bit self-critical here as well just yeah. like generally with with my yeah. our experience with flight in your, in your learning process and maybe you know just you know getting up to speed with flight mm -hmm. yeah gotcha um hmm well I I feel like Hmm. I have to think about that a bit because I I feel like it was um well one thing that was really helpful for us is that somebody else within the team had a lot of experience with flight so I was able to connect with him first and that kind of like made it a little bit easier for me to like you know hop in on the the Slack community and stuff um but I I really felt like um it's really nice how responsive everybody is like I feel like I can just post a question and then right away they'll be like a bunch of different people responding on it like I I feel like with a lot of big slack communities sometimes there's the problem where like once it gets very big someone posts a question and there's kind of the diffusion of responsibility and no one responds and I feel like with the, the flight community there's um 
I, I usually get like multiple responses um, as, as well as just very timely <laughs> responses. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was definitely like really helpful and really encouraging for getting um, up to speed. I think, I guess thinking about it now, the um, maybe couple of things that I, I think I already talked um, with Dan about this, like during the process is like um, getting, I think there are a few things like getting flight um, running in like a local cluster so that I could test everything end to end and getting the um, like the front end so that I could um, connect to the flight console was something that was like not really documented and like Dan kind of like showed me the tricks of the trade there and um, how to get everything set up so that that worked. Um, so yeah, having um, maybe an, an easier way to an easier option to like get that working because the console is so useful for local debugging when you're using a local cluster um, or or just like having it documented somewhere. I think like either one would be, um, yeah, really helpful and really nice. Um, and then otherwise, I feel like, yeah, me coming in as a contributor, um, just like figuring out the um, like the PR process and like who to add and everything like that. Um, I wouldn't have known <laughs> where, where to go there if, uh, if it weren't for Dan like leading the charge. Um, so yeah, I think those are the things that I like wouldn't um, really have known, but otherwise got like, you know, really, really great support from you guys. So fantastic. I love it. Thank you so much. And I feel like for us, um, I don't know, Kathan has raised his hand for us uh, real quick. I think there's a lot of inspiration there to, to understand, you know, where we have actually our, um, you know, a hard, uh, more difficult areas to get people, you know, in the learning process to, to from the discovery part into the learning part and then into the build part and basically applying all of those things. So documentation is really important. So we uh, put a big focus on that. Kathan, you raised your hand. Yeah, uh, Eileen, firstly, thank you for sharing. And that the contribution is just amazing. So thank you. Uh, uh, so I... Uh, I heard you like the contribution and we actually, this is maybe a spoiler for E and others there, something's coming out soon that will help you really test things faster. And that's our goal. And we would love feedback on it. Like we love that, hey, this works or this doesn't work. Um, and hopefully that encourages you to to another contribution. Um, so uh, keep keep your eyes open and, and hopefully help us improve the process um, at least by giving already feedback. Uh, one one more thing. I I read your stuff. It's like software is <laughs> world slowly, you know, turning to rust. I I completely believe that's true. Uh, <laughs> so we are uh, in fact thinking of something interesting with rust. Uh, let me know if you are interested in contributing. Uh, DM me please. So thank you. Fantastic. And for those who don't, uh, I just want to introduce uh, Kathan too because. I think you, you forgot. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, so Kathan is obviously co-founder of Union and uh, TSC chair here with Flight and uh, is uh, one of the founding members, obviously, and then the core uh, original engineering team creating Flight. Cool. Good. Let's, uh, Eileen, thank you so much. So let's see if we can get uh, your contributions, your support, maybe on the Rust side, uh, if there's something that Kathan has in mind, maybe there's an area to collaborate there. We'll see. Uh, thanks so much. Let's uh, say hello to Nicholas. I think Nicholas should be online here. Just going to check in. Nicholas, are you there? I don't see him. Okay, so then, um, then but I, I can give you a little bit of. I work with Nick. Uh, okay, cool. Let's combine this. So, so let's go to the next slide, with, which is you, Justin. So that, that's that's your slide, Justin. You work with Nick. So um, same thing here. Please, obviously, unmute yourself and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you know what your contribution is. Yeah. So I like I said, I work with Nick uh, Lafaso as part of the methane set. Uh, you know, team and um, just a little background about what methane sat is. It's a it's a subsidiary of Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, we're launching a satellite next year in uh, that's going to detect methane emissions from oil and gas agricultural sources. Um, so we have a lot of uh, need to process raw satellite data, and we're using. Uh, flight to do that. So, um, and we have different users. There's going to be basically the methane sat uh, uh, employees that are going to be processing the data from. There's five five different stages of processing the data to make it available for consumption to the public. Um, so we're going to be processing that data, 
in our kind of a production environment. And we have a lot of contributions from scientists from Harvard and other uh, places um, who are refining algorithms and whatnot to, to do that processing. So we have a, we're, we're, we're probably gonna run, you know, a, a not a vanilla flight deployment in that we'll, we'll have multiple flight uh, interfaces, whether you're running the, the real production data processing or you're running some dev and, and test type of stuff. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, what we're using it for. Um, the, the contribution, so, so I should preface it with, we're running on Google Cloud. Uh, you know, we have an agreement with GCP so we're that that is our our, our cloud uh, deployment uh, environment, um, and you know Google Cloud has a little some nuances, I guess, idiosyncrasies that uh, you know the flight authentication with Google uh, out of the box is not streamlined. I guess is is what you would say. Um, so there's obviously there's two different authentication mechanisms in flight. There's the user, and then there's uh, you know to the the UI console, and then there's the uh, flight admin auth uh, for the actual you know flight propeller and flight control to communicate with flight admin, right? So the what I was working on was uh, a way to basically promote the flight packages from a development environment where, where we have a, just a release cycle um, and we promote the flight packages themselves up into a staging or a production environment um, where we have flight running. And I was just looking for a way to, um, you know, use flight control to register those packages. And this, as it, I just stumbled upon uh, the, the fact that the, the flight, uh, Helm chart and values and, and actual Go code under the covers was using just a a, a hashed password um, that was if you don't change it you're exposed uh, essentially right so um, anyway I quickly reached out to uh, Yi and he was extremely responsive um, and just to make sure I wasn't missing something or doing something incorrectly uh, so yeah and and. You know, you know, he he led me down the the, the path to uh, change that uh, default password, if you will, um, and we you know propagated that solution through our flight uh, installations, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, all there is to it. Um, that's I mean, look, I mean, it's just like I just want to bring Yi in as well. I think Yi here, if you if you have a chance to speak up, maybe we can hear from your side a little bit about the discovery of this vulnerability and the general uh, feedback about the, uh, the methane set use case. Hey, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say that, thank you again to Justin for bringing it up. Um, uh, this was something that we uh, kind of accidentally uh, glossed over, I guess we should have, uh, expected this to be a more, more widely uh, known use case. Um, so it doesn't affect people who are using third-party authorization servers. This only affects the internal admin authorization server. But um, yeah, once, once if you, there's a, I think we added a little script to um, hash and hash whatever password you choose. And then you put that into uh, you put that into the, the admin configuration. Yeah, I think the our environment is not like as as I said the, the vanilla environment, right? Um, I think it's not it's off the beaten path. Most people are not using it the way that we are. Um, so you know, out of the box, if you just install it with you know auth to uh, flight, you know authorization, uh, flight admin authorization enabled. Um, out of the box, if you don't pay enough attention and change that uh, default credential, you're exposed. That was what uh, the problem was for us. And in Google, um, they don't really have a, a way. So we have identity aware proxy on GCP to handle the user authentication. But because of the way flight admin um, is implemented using gRPC, that does not play well with Google's uh, load balancers. 
So, you know, we still had to have uh, the flight admin off enabled. Um, but yeah, we, we, it just wasn't obvious to us either that the, the password uh, needed to be changed uh, or, or what it was, right? So it's uh, basically just a learning uh, process. And I think most people are using either Okta or Keycloak or AWS. Um, and we're a nonprofit, so paying for a separate, paying for Okta is really not an option for us. Um, so it, it's one of those things where like uh, flight plus Google, there's a, a few little extra hurdles that you have to jump through. Okay. But Yi, thank you, thank you for helping out there um, in, in addressing like uh, the, our, in, our, our situation immediately. Appreciate it. That's awesome. Thanks, Yi. And uh, Justin, thanks a lot for, um, you know, this out. I think it's very important. Um, Kathan said it earlier here as well. I feel like security is a big part. So we, we jump on that immediately. And I feel like it's really important for the, for the community to, you know, um, take a look at this too. I feel like that's the most important, one of the most important areas, specifically now with you, with your use case, Justin, I feel like uh, if I remember correctly, what Nicholas said, um, uh, half a year ago that you also have uh, on the deployment side, you have like a very big deployment. You use like quite a lot of uh, compute power on GCP. Is that correct? Have you scaled this up at this I mean, in the meanwhile over the last half year or what's the current status for you guys there? Yeah, so up until the beginning of this year, uh, you know, we hadn't been able to like really run, you know, data pipelines for processing data because we did, the, the satellite hasn't, it won't launch until next year. Um, but we do, GCP does have a quota uh, as most cloud providers do. And, you know, they're a little bit strapped for the, the CPU uh, resources that we need. Um, and it's region based, right? So, um, you know, they allow us, uh, they give us an allotment or a quota for certain CPUs in certain regions um, for certain projects or environments. So, um, the good news is we, we just recently this month have started processing data, um, but it's not from the satellite itself. It's from the same sensors mounted to, uh, an aircraft. So, uh, we call it methane air and, um, yeah, we're scaling up to, uh, 800, 900 node clusters, uh, on GKE, um, in, in Google and, uh, we've been running data uh ever since honestly it's, it's this last seven days has been when we first started getting data in right and it's very complicated in terms of applying the algorithms uh from that the, that the scientists uh give to us and us integrating it into flight and dealing with uh gcp's quota limitations and um yeah so there's quite a, a lot for us to do but we have we have started making some some great progress and yeah we run like i said 800 nodes for a few hours um and that's just for you know a short time slice window of data uh when the satellite goes up it's going to be you know a uh, continuous uh influx of data that we're going to have to uh, process so we're definitely heading in the right direction but we got a lot more work to do yeah, yeah, and it sounds like um, with with the latest uh, unfortunate uh, de developments in the North Sea with the methane emission of uh, the pipeline there, I'm pretty sure you probably um, combed over some uh, spatial imagery there as well to see what's going on. Yeah, I mean, we not yet, not, not until the satellites up in the air, um, but like right now, we're just over the U.S. airspace uh, with with the aircraft uh, for now, but for sure. The need for measuring and and you know, like holding people uh it's actually in the best interest of of uh oil and gas community to stop leaks uh as well as his best interest for the the planet at large uh to stop the leaks so it'll be a, it'll be a great thing uh when we get everything up and running and uh flights helping us to do it and and we have a question from Eileen. Uh, I mean, if you, I'm reading it out, data and chest from satellite is going to be continuous with no gaps between ground contacts, question mark? Um, so I don't really, I can't speak to all of it, but we basically have control of 
where we aim the satellite and for how long we aim that uh, sensor, uh, aim the sensors on the satellite and for how long. So what we usually get is uh, maybe 30 time slots per day. And we have to pick and choose where we will uh, uh, scan, I, I guess is the right word. Um, so yeah, it's not going to be a continuous, it'll be a continuously ingesting data from the the ground uh, systems satellites. Uh, and they have, I'm sorry, the ground stations. Um, so we'll be getting all that data from them, but it's not like a, you know, we, there definitely are like windows. So we have a whole another side of, you know, not the data processing side, but the uh, command and control side for the satellite that plans and schedules what, what the flight path is and where we're going to uh, scan. You know, there's a lot of things involved, including weather. Um, it has to be a relatively clear day for us to get uh, good readings. Um, you know, so yeah, it's a good question, but it's, you can see it's, it, there's a lot of complexity in, in the answer. Yeah, no, fantastic. So, so Justin, thanks a lot for, um, you know, contributing also uh, stepping in here from the class a little bit more. We would love to report about and talk to you in the future. Once you get you know, potentially your data, ground station data from the satellite uh, in, in a way that we can see what, how the system works, that would be fantastic. So we'll bring you back at that time. Yeah. And there's a, we're going to have a UI and all the data is going to be publicly available once we vet it. Um, you know, it, so it's meant for public consumption. Um, and if you go up one slide to next slide, he does have a uh, presentation that he gave, um, hmm. you know, that probably is a little bit more professional uh, than, the, than the intro that I just gave about what we're doing with it. I think the intro was pretty good. <laughs> so thank you so much. Yeah, so there's actually um, uh, a YouTube video about uh, methane set too. If you haven't seen this, check out the Flight YouTube channel. It's There's a lot of information uh, in there. I think it's pretty, pretty amazing. Also, I think what Chama does, uh, Adin, is, is also super amazing. I love those projects that actually have a scale that is like beyond what you usually do. And so fantastic. Great, thanks a lot, Justin. So let's uh, move on and say hi to, to Ryan. I'm, uh, I thought he's online, yes. Hi, Ryan, please unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing at the Lloyds Banking Group and uh, your Hacktoberfest flight contributions because there were more than just one, so the stage is yours. Cool, um, thanks for inviting me, guys. Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh... Um, so yeah, I, I'm a senior data scientist, a machine learning engineer at uh, Lloyds Banking Group. Um, it's based in the UK, London. Uh, but they've got different uh, different kind of um, headquarters all over the UK. Uh, so we kind of, we are very, those who don't know, not, not aware of Lloyds Banking Group, they're a very big uh, financial institution. We provide services to uh, about 30 million customers in the UK, meaning the retail and commercial space. So uh, my role in as a senior data scientist is basically to provide um, sort of uh, help with like sort of providing um, sort of machine learning services to the rest of the bank. Um, I'm also doing a lot of work in sort of uh, developing pipelines within Lloyd's and helping other departments, for example. Um, so basically, we're not using, I'm not using flight specifically in Lloyd's. Um, it's just because we've got a lot of legacy systems, getting new kind of uh, tooling into uh, the bank is quite difficult. Um, also, we also, you know, kind of hybrid on-prem and, um, it's yeah there's, there's a lot of bureaucracy basically so uh, it, so the idea is uh how i came across flight was because we are actually looking at using pandera uh for some of our data validation kind of checks within our pipeline um so i was researching with pandera and i came across this youtube video uh, by niels um i think he delivered one on um uh, in pycon i think and was like uh, one on uh, integrating pandera flight and streamlit um, and then I thought, oh, flight looks quite cool because the stuff we're doing kind of manually, uh, building all our different kind of tasks, et cetera, uh, flight does all that for free. Um, you can have a nice UI where you can actually visualize uh, how our workflow and our DAG is kind of integrated together. Um, so I kind of started looking at flight a bit more. Um, this was like back in, I think, September, just before uh, Hacktoberfest. Um, I did like a few tutorials uh, on flight. I quite liked it. 
Um, I normally do participate in Hacktoberfest every year. Um, and I then suddenly saw the flight for doing this special kind of uh, swag kind of thing. So I said, okay, uh, let, let me just, uh, um, maybe I can, uh, maybe I can contribute to it. Like uh, I've not never used flight before, but let me just see, you know, let me just ping uh, the community and see what, what they think. Um, and I was quite like surprised, they're quite an open community. And um, I've contributed to quite a few other kind of projects as well, like, you know, Pandas and um, Case for Profit, they're quite nice as well. But I think the whole fact, uh, the, the, the whole kind of organization of this with, you know, the, the Slack group and a specific Hacktoberfest dedicated channel was quite nice and enabled me to get uh, started quite quickly, uh, understand like what issues, you know, um, to work on, for example, to nicely labeled with the Hacktoberfest label, et cetera. Um, so basically, yeah, so if I just briefly go over like my contributions, so um, I kind of looked through the number of issues that were being like taken, taken quite quickly by a number of people. Um, but I wanted to kind of um, um, merge together my interests with like flights. So like I was quite interested in like, distributed computing. So I thought, you know, VAX was a good kind of uh, ticket to look at. Maybe I can, you know, uh, do some kind of um, integration with VAX. Um, and then I think there's a, a ticket by Katen that he had raised on like uh, supporting VAX as a, a native type. Um, and so I'd have to learn about like, you know, how to kind of uh, create, create a plugin, for example, and create like a structured data set format. Uh, so now basically we the any user should now my PR has been merged in so any user should now be able to install that plugin um, and then create like a, a VAX type for example within a, a task and then pass it to different tasks. Um, there, there's 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 a, few, there's a few other issues that I've kind of uh, raised as well as a subsequent kind of work on this. So at the moment this only um, serializes to Parquet, but I think we could support HD, HTF5 as well as um, Arrow as well for larger data sets. Um, and also, uh, this would possibly not. Um, so at the moment, we um, are basically only supporting like um, a, a single kind of. We're not actually supporting like um, passing in a list of uh, data frames. So we want to like also support that as well, like multiple chunks. So there's, there's another issue for that as well. Um, <clears throat> so I think that the next the, so that 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 went well. So there was a lot of like reviews on that and a strict review process. Right, thanks to uh, Samita and. Um, um, I think Kevin as well. Um, the next one was on a type transformer. So this was uh, possibly the trickiest of the lot because um, I think I initially started working it. I think um, it, that the, there's, there's a number of ways you could do this basically uh, within the TensorFlow docs. So uh, the way you can kind of serialize to a TensorFlow record is um, you can either use a TensorFlow example type or you can use a TensorFlow data to data set type. Um, and basically, I should have probably um, uh, conferred with some of the uh, team regarding what their preferred design would be. So I initially started off by like just um, creating a, uh, a type transform transformer for TensorFlow example, um, and then basically created that. But then I think um, Samita and Neil, we having discussions, thought that it'd be better to support um, just extending a uh, the native kind of flight file type to a TensorFlow record type. Uh, a file um, and then basically letting that handle the serialization and deserialization to TensorFlow record. Um, so I'm kind of working on that at, at the moment. I think there's another kind of parallel discussion on supporting TensorFlow data to data set separately. Uh, so I think, yes, yeah, so I'm currently working on that. Um, the next one is just basically like fixing a few my errors. There's, there's an issue on like um, basically in the whole code base, there's uh, a lot of my pie errors, so I was just pick, just yeah, I was working with Kevin on that to um, fix a few errors for like the those are raising like incompatible in, in types, for example, in the day in the code base. Um, um, I couldn't go through all of them because they were just too much. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, and the last one is basically just uh, so I think um, this this the, the last bit was also quite useful because I think because um, my my kind of opinion is like the tutorial section could possibly include a lot more things for new users. Um, I think it's probably uh, quite bad at the moment because as a new user I was coming, I was coming in and there's probably a few, um, there was not that many tutorials on like um, different kind of use cases uh, within machine learning. For example, there was one on like, um, you know, like um, sort of house pricing and uh, diabetes, for example, the NLP one is, is a good one to have. There could be possibly one on like uh, how you could integrate like Tandera and Streamlit as well. Um, I suppose, like, um, just as, as a kind of new user, user coming in to see how you can integrate different things. But yeah, I was working on this um, tutorial. Um, basically, what I did was I kind of just 
uh, mimic the GenSim kind of documentation um, to basically uh, create a workflow which uh, reads in a sample a data set, uh, create a word to back, uh, train a word to back model, um, and also a topic model. Um, do some NLP pre-processing on the data set, so that's a separate task. Um, and then the the models would be like uh, training of the models would be two separate tasks. Yes, they're serialized and they're read in for the next task. Uh, and then we print out like a list of topics and like similar words, uh, and they all kind of like chain together in the workflow. Um, and then it, it leads like a beautiful DAG. So uh, on uh, the output, so I've kind of written up a tutorial on that. I think it's almost there. Um, there's been quite a few like um, back and forths with the reviews to get the um, um, descriptions kind of correct, but that's kind of almost there. So it should be going in quite soon. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, that's basically all I've uh, done. And I guess like, yeah, I also do enjoy contributing to other open source libraries in general. And I do, um, my interests also lie like uh, strongly in AWS as well and MLOps. Um, I'll be keen to also contribute more to like, so the AWS kind of integration with flight and additional plugins that could go in, for example. Um, maybe I could discuss that with the team in the future. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have really. That's all. <laughs> it was quite a lot. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, this is just, uh, uh, you know, fantastic to see that. Uh, and absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, on the tutorial side, specifically now using, you know, you know, an NLP example of work to back or, you know, other stuff. This is fantastic to see, you know, how you can use the platform there. So totally appreciate it on our side. And I think uh, we should probably have a conversation, bring you back and and take a little bit more of a look into um, because also you come from a data science perspective, and I feel like data scientists have a, a very unique perspective about, you know, moving from a Jupyter workflow to a, I mean, let's say workflow in quotation marks to a real workflow um, that's more functional. Uh, I think those are topics that I would love to discuss with you. So whenever you're ready, we can yeah. talk more about data science. Okay, yeah. okay, let's do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. That's fantastic. Um, so more slides, links, and resources. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, obviously, we have our office hours. Just want to remind everyone, one with Hatham, Red Eye, Midday with Katrina, and uh, with Samita, the late night M MLOps uh, hours. Uh, so take advantage of them. I think they're super helpful, incredibly helpful. And then Outlook uh, towards the next uh, open sourcing. It's November 15th with Calvin Level from Embark Veterinary. Um, so if you haven't booked it, take the calendar invite. If you want to look at the resource, specifically the methane set video that I mentioned earlier, go to the YouTube channel. And also, if you want to stay up to date, just uh, subscribe to the newsletter. With that, I just want to say thanks to each and everyone here. I think this was super interesting. Looking forward uh, to seeing you all on November 15th. Take care. Bye-bye.